people and to see these these amazing clinicians. So for me to be involved, it's it's a true honor. Thank you so much. I have to say, as I told you, I think years ago, um, I'm a great fan of you, and I truly enjoy your beautiful, beautiful work. And I was really looking forward for the good opportunity to have you and to talk with you. And I'm so grateful that you joined and you accepted and hopefully we meet soon in person. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the world is getting, um, you know, a little bit more back to normal here at least. So hopefully, hopefully we'll be, be traveling soon. You're in Iran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I should say Iran. Yeah, Iran. Iran. I say it like yeah. an American. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Iran. Yeah, things, ho hopefully, actually here is also, things are get, is getting better, but, you know, it's not a stable. So at least it's not really okay for people to travel around the world easily, but really hope that things get better and we see each other soon. Absolutely. So would you like me to share my screen and we'll start there? Usually, as you know, usually we will have a short introduction. I will uh, introduce uh, the show and have your mm -hmm. topic and your CV, and then I will ask you to share the screen. And at the end, you can stop share and we can have a short, short discussion on the topic. So before we start, I want to know what is the exact title of the presentation so I can announce it. The title of this of the presentation is Stabilization for Horizontal GBR. Great. And those, your, your own technique, right? Those screws that you presented. So I'm going to finish with that. I think I'm going to give, uh, how long do you want the presentation to be? Usually it's around 40, 45 minutes, but if you need to extend it, it's fine. You know, I'll probably even go about that time a little bit under even. I mean, I think, you know, for me, it's important that people understand sort of like, I'm not trying to take credit for anything. It's all an evolution, you know? And, and of course, you know, doing GBR is something that there's so many different ways of doing it, but it's based on, on these foundational principles, which I'll, I'll kind of start with. I'll move to some of the cases that I do on an everyday basis. And then I'll show that case towards the end because I know that case kind of got you a little excited. Yeah. It made me excited. Really excited. <laughs> so yeah, Matt, it's a, yeah. Yeah. So it's a stabilization techniques for horizontal ridge augmentation, right? Absolutely. Yep. Great. Great. So if you're okay, I can start the. Yep. Absolutely. Great. Hello everyone, welcome back to Hot Seat Season 3. I'm Omid Mogadas joining you from Tehran. And once again, I'm so happy to have the chance to share this educational platform with my dear friends and colleagues, experts in the field of perio and implant from around the world with you all. And I'm pretty sure it's a valuable information that these people are kind enough to share with all of us through their expertise and their experiences. And I think it's a great chance for everyone to listen to them, to learn from them, especially during these situations that it's not, e that it's not easy to travel, to take courses. So I'm so thankful that all these great guests accepted the invitation and are sharing their knowledge, their valuable expertise with all of us. And today, a very dear friend from the United States, has accepted to join Hot Seat. Dr. Matthew Fien is here with me. Hello, Matthew, and welcome to Good Hot to Seat. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you Very so Very excited much. to be here. It's, it's my pleasure, and I'm pretty sure so many people are familiar with you and your work, and I have to say, usually I say it at the end, but I want to say it now that uh, he's an active person on Instagram also, and he's so kind enough to share his cases with the world. And I have to say, his work is exceptional. And if you want to follow him, I, I really actually recommend you all to follow him. And his page is called Fianodontics. So he's doing it, he's a style and beautiful case management. So you can learn a lot from his page also. I'm pretty sure you will enjoy his presentation also today, which will be on stabilization techniques in horizontal ridge augmentation. And he will go in depth of all the principles that are essential for achieving a successful result in these kind of procedures. So before we start, I would like to have 
a short CV of Dr. Matthew Fien with all of you uh, as a tradition of hot seat. And then we will go through the presentation and for sure we will have a great discussion on the topic, this exciting topic at the end. Dr. Matthew Fien received his bachelor's degree from the University of Florida and his doctorate degree from Columbia University School of Dental and Oral Surgery. He completed postgraduate training in a specialty of periodontology at Nova Southeastern University and is a board certified by the American Academy of Periodontology. He has completed a number of research projects which have led to his work being published in various peer-reviewed journals, including Journal of Periodontology, Journal of Oral Maxiofacial Surgery, Compendium of the Continuing Education, and IJPRD. He is actively engaged in several clinical research studies in the field of periodontics, implant dentistry, and tissue regeneration. In addition to research projects, he has begun speaking as an expert extensively on guided bone regeneration and soft tissue grafting. He enjoys being a part of dental community on Instagram, as I told you, and also he's an active member of American Academy of Perio and Academy of Osteointegration. And I have to say, he's a great tennis player and basketball player. So Matthew. Yeah, there you go. Those are my two sports. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so we are ready for your beautiful presentation, my friend. You can share your screen. Here we go. How does that look? Great. Okay, so first I, I have to thank you again. It, it's really an honor to be here. I, I've really enjoyed your, all of your series and all, all of your lectures. I've probably seen close to 95% of them. As listening to the doctors explain the rationale for why they do things is just as important as these techniques themselves. Of course, you know, with dentistry, just like everything, I always compare it to um, almost like, you know, rock and roll or these music bands. There's nothing new. It's all, it's all learning from, from the people that have come before us. And to me, that is really what's, what's changed the way I practice. And actually, why I started Final Dentics, I think is important because this is not to say that these techniques that I'm showing you are the only way to do things. But for me, this is the way that has been very predictable in my hands and has allowed me to take on more advanced cases and, of course, to improve predictability because that's what we're all looking for. And I love seeing guys that are doing these very complex cases with titanium mesh and, and ridge augmentation with uh, titanium reinforced PT, PTFE. And it's amazing to see, and I've gotten better by learning from all of these folks that have just incredible hands and incredible minds as well. Um, but for me, my wheelhouse has really been, you know, more moderate horizontal GBR because I think those are the cases that I just see most often, right? Those are the cases that come into the clinic on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and I really felt um, not so confident, I think I should say, when I came out of training right? It was only after years and years of trial and error with different materials and different techniques that I started finding my, my confidence. And that's what I want to share with you today. Um, of course, everybody's very familiar with the, the past principle. And I think that's just a great sentinel article because it breaks things down very, very simply. We need to have really good blood supply to our bone grafts. We need to have a way to maintain the space, which is so critical. And of course, using tenting screws is a, is a great way of doing that. But now, you know, we have materials like uh, PRF, you know, sticky bone that allow us to get some more stabilization than we could in years past without, you know, that, that technology. Um, and of course, with ridge augmentation, we always want primary closure. But what I find to be the trickiest part of these ridge augmentation cases is how to keep things stable. And I always explain to my students, it, it's a very simple analogy, but when you break your arm, you need to have a cast on so that the bone has a chance to heal. And if there's trauma or if there's micro movement, you're really going to limit the amount of regeneration that you can achieve. And so we're really going to focus on, on that first S of the past principle today, which is stabilization. Okay, and I know all of us are very, very, very familiar with the work of Dr. Istvan Urban. He's been a huge influence on my career. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've actually read his his amazing book and seen him speak. And every time I learn something different. Um, but when we're talking about ridge augmentation in the horizontal dimension, of course, you know, we can use a native collagen membrane. 
do the sausage technique, and we can really achieve very, very predictable results. The tough thing, of course, is using the tacks and the screws. I think that's really the biggest hangup for most people. And when we have a case like this, we certainly have a, a very significant uh, buckle concavity. It may even have a, a palatal component to the defect, but we can design our incisions in such a way that we get access to the depth of the defect. Um, we can break down the incision design for hours. I won't do that here, but this is just a very common incision design for me in the anterior. And then what I've learned through, through Instagram and through reading articles and, and amazing lectures by, by Istvan Urban and many others is, you know, the hardest area to tack or to secure, I usually will do first. So in a case like this, we'll tack or, or use screws to secure that membrane on the palatal first. That allows me to really overbuild the defect. Okay, and to me, um, you know, making sure we have an adequate volume of bone under the membrane is going to be the most important thing. And it's, I think it's something that's often overlooked. We just don't use enough bone. If we're not using enough bone, we're not maintaining the space. And no matter what we do, no matter how beautiful our incision design is, no matter how beautiful our primary closure is, if we don't have adequate space maintenance and, of course, stability of that, of that graft membrane complex, we're not going to achieve the results that we want. And I've gotten way better at this by working with, with some amazing doctors. Uh, Dr. Israel Putterman is one of my um, good friends and one of my partners in, in the bone grafting course that we teach. And just watching how he will, and, and he was actually a student of Istvan Urban, so he really uh, is very familiar with all these concepts, but really just allowing us to put that bone graft where we need it. And this case, for example, um, is a case that healed very, very well, and we had really nice turnover of our bone graft. Um, and that was because of the fact that we were able to get it so secure. And you can see just how taut that membrane looks, um, and it's encasing our bone graft, and we keep our bone graft where we want it most. And so, of course, getting primary closure over this area is going to be critical. We don't want to lose our bone graft materials. We don't want our membrane or any of our biologic materials exposed in the mouth because, of course, those membranes will start to break down quicker if they're being exposed to the oral cavity. Um, but we can do that with some techniques. I usually will uh, follow uh, the Rhonda article where they basically do a very single, very uh, shallow periosteal releasing incision and then stretching within that incision line. That was really a game changer for me because doing these blind incisions like I was taught in training, you know, created this scenario where patients were very swollen after surgery. Um, they would get black and blue. They would get very bruised. So that article was really sentinel for my education. Um, and we can use that for all sorts of, of procedures that require, you know, tension-free closure. And so as you see here, we, we were able to release the tension in that flap. And despite the fact that we were adding this monstrous volume of bone, we're able to get primary closure without any tension. And to me, that's one of the, the most critical things is not having to worry about that flap opening like we, like we briefly discussed. So you see some beautiful healing after about four months, four and a half months. Again, this is not a severe defect, but it's a moderate defect. So usually I'm waiting only about four and a half months on these cases. And when I re-enter, I'm very pleased to see very little remnants of particulate graft. Of course, this comes with some challenges. Using tacks and screws, especially if you're not used to using tacks and screws so much, um, is a little bit challenging. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but of course, then we have this discussion of do we have to remove these tacks and screws? Can we leave them? And in many cases, I will actually leave them because I don't want to open things up again. We're always trying to do things minimally invasive. And not that elevating this flap will cause so much trauma, but of course, once you elevate the flap or you have to elevate the marginal tissue, I should say, that's when we're really predisposing ourselves to aesthetic deficiencies, which are very difficult to, to correct later on. Um, in this case, we went ahead, we opened it, we had great bone, we were able to place our implant. And again, we have this great volume of bone that we were able to regenerate and in a very simple fashion for the most part, right? I had very little risk of post-operative infection because I wasn't using titanium. I wasn't using titanium reinforced PTFE or titanium mesh. Um, all, for the most part, resorbable materials except for those screws and those tacks. And um, I'm not reinventing the wheel here, but these are the two kits that, um, of course, are recommended by many of the amazing oral surgeons and periodontists that perform these types of techniques. Uh, we all love this master pin kit because those 
those tacks that were designed by Istvan Urban, they're just very strong and they can go in at, at, at sort of an off angle, um, which you can't do with many of the other kits. And then of course, um, using Profix, this Profix kit has been really, really valuable to me. And I don't use this driver here. Um, is, uh, Dr. Putterman, like I mentioned, has been an incredible influence on me and, and made me better at using tacks and screws. But his best recommendation for me was to use the handpiece driver for this kit. So rather than using the screwdriver, which makes it very difficult to get good apical force to secure your membrane, you know, using the handpiece driver, setting it at five newtons, really allows you a lot more flexibility to be able to use screws and tacks. And I'll say, as someone who, I don't consider myself an expert at the sausage technique, I'm still learning and getting better and better as, as with each and every case that I do, um, I, I'm not confident that I can do well with either of these alone. So whenever I'm planning on doing a sausage technique, I always have both of these kits out on the table. And that might be my, my uh, inability to uh, secure the membrane cleanly or get access in some cases, but I just feel more comfortable having both options. And actually in many of the cases that I do perform sausage, I will use one or two tacks with one or two screws. Um, and you know, you can see that on a lot of my cases on Instagram, it's not one or the other, they're not mutually exclusive. And the reason for that is because neither of these materials are very easy to use. So this is a, a funny video that I created when I was actually putting together some content for one of our GBR courses. And like I said, using this handpiece driver is great, but what happens, you know, this thing wants to move around. And in this case, I, you know, obviously it's, it's, a, it's just a model. So it was really funny for me to have this happen because this is what will happen in real life. Um, and this is actually the least of my problems, right? Typically what will happen is that membrane may start to tear or it may start to crinkle up on itself. And these membranes are not cheap. So once you start ruining a membrane, the last thing you want to do is have to go back to your storage cabinet and, and pick out another membrane. And so certainly um, there's a lot of amazing clinicians that can teach you these sorts of techniques. And I think that they're very, very valuable. But for me, a huge game changer was when I started learning about stabilization with sutures. And as a periodontist, we know we've been stabilizing free gingival grafts, for instance, using the periodontium. For, for many, many years. Um, it's a technique I've seen many iterations of. Um, and you know, the Sentinel articles for me are the Steigman article with Salama, talking about a periosteal pocket flap. Um, Urban actually showed using uh, periosteal vertical mattresses to stabilize smaller defects. And then we're all familiar, of course, with Nieva's lasso technique. And so when I looked at these three articles, I started saying to myself, well, what is possible with sutures? What is the limitations of using sutures versus tax? But when can I get away with using sutures? Because it allows me to get away from using the tax and the screws um, when I can. And, and again, I'm not here to say that you can do everything with sutures, but I think there's certainly a large uh, proportion of cases that present to my clinic that I can get away using these stabilization sutures. And so really the simplest form of this, uh, here's a great picture, just showing the, the stabilization that we can achieve because we've released the periosteum. We now have almost this secondary internal flap that at its apical extent is still um, attached to the bone. And so it's relatively fixed, fixed in place. And we can actually just use our sutures and the palatal flap to anchor those sutures and get some really nice stabilization. So for me, obviously, it's not about just growing bone. We need to grow bone where we need the bone. And so a case like this where I had a failed implant, you could see the, the residual threads uh, imprinted into that lingual plate or that palatal plate. Um, I can stabilize over that ridge with this sort of technique in a very easy fashion, very inexpensive, but most importantly, very predictable way to regenerate that buccal occlusal line angle. And so starting to do stabilization sutures for these smaller cases allowed me to start thinking a little bit bigger picture and saying, well, what if I have larger defects? What if I have defects that aren't um, you know, sockets where there's no walls uh, or at least only one or two walls remaining as opposed to a more confined defect like this, could I still use stabilization? And this is a common scenario I think we all see and we all battle with where we have a, a site where we certainly have a defect that we could identify on the CT scan before the surgery. Um, we place our implant, we start to see a little green stick fracture of the buccal plate or 
maybe we just place our implant, it's completely within the housing of the bone, but the bone is just very, very thin. And we start saying to ourselves, well, I can do this in one stage, but I, I really need to overbuild this. I'm not using titanium reinforced membranes, so I need to make sure that I, I compensate for the fact that we're gonna get some shrinkage, especially in the maxilla where I find the lip pressure could really do a number on our bone grafts. And so I will do simply what I showed you before. This is the same native collagen membrane I showed you that we, we use for the sausage technique, but I'm using the stabilization sutures. And this is very simple. This is just one suture and I have a, the knot internally. It's a resorbable suture, so I can leave that knot internally. But you can see I can really bulk out the area. And then when I would go back four to five months later, which I'll show you in a second, um, you'll see that we're really able to regenerate. And I just love this picture because it's very important if you're going to be doing stabilization sutures, the, the releasing incision occurs first, right? I know a lot of us like to do the releasing incision earlier in the surgery anyway. It decreases bleeding and the risk of hematoma formation later. But it's especially important in cases where we're going to stabilize with sutures because we need that periosteum to grab. Um, and so this is just one simple way to do this um, using the, the internal internal periosteal sutures. This is chromic gut in this case. And again, that internal knot. And I get primary closure here. I am not so worried about getting dual layer closure. I don't want to move the mucogingival junction too much, but I'm able to use this very biocompatible me membrane um, to approximate the flap edges. And notice here, I'm still using a typical horizontal mattress suture after I do my stabilization suture. But then when I go to uncover at about four and a half months, I see that I've really done well on that buckle, that buckle occlusal line angle and that buckle um, thickness. And that's what's gonna define my soft tissue uh, anatomy, which is really very important for that long-term functional st and aesthetic stability. And so in these cases, you know, it, the, the biggest downfall is having to remove bone to find your implant, but I feel very comfortable starting out the restorative phase of treatment when I know that my implants have bone up to that top thread. And so that's really what I want to create. And I want to now take this sort of technique and use it for larger cases, larger ridge, augmenta larger ridge augmentation cases, where previously I really would have been forced to use much more, um, I want to say, dangerous materials in a sense that there, there's much more risk for post-operative morbidity. Um, whereas with this sort of uh, scenario, I feel very comfortable with the reduced risk of infection and just patient management for me is huge, right? I, I am I'm the type of guy that I hate having failures. I, I hate it for a multitude of reasons, but I, I just feel very bad when a patient has a post-operative infection. Um, it becomes a big patient management issue. Um, them showing up in the clinic a couple of days after surgery and things are wide open or there may be some separation because once that happens, you're really, you're starting over. And so I want to find ways to do larger cases using this same sort of technique. And so um, what types of cases can we, can we use stabilization sutures? Well, pretty much any area area where you have a, a long span defect or a much larger defect um, than a typical mild horizontal you know, ridge deficiency, uh, especially for cases where you have buccal and lingual or palatal component to the defect. Um, I think you know, using stabilization sutures is going to be great. Can you um, maintain as much space and stabilize as well as if you're using uh, tacks and screws? I don't think so. I think that certainly that tacks and screws will always have a place and we'll get to that sort of towards the end of my presentation. But I think that in a majority of cases, like I've mentioned, I think using these sorts of techniques can really go a very, very long way. And as I've sort of gotten better at using stabilization sutures, you notice things look a little bit differently here than they did in some of the previous cases. So I've actually started using um, knots on the palatal for a lot of these cases. I find that I can really get much better, um, uh, I should say, um, evenness in my tension across the, the length of the graft. I've kind of gotten a little bit smarter about making sure that my membranes are large enough to compensate for the amount of bone graft that we're placing. I think that's the second biggest mistake people make. Not only did we not use enough, enough bone graft material, but our membranes aren't long enough. And I, I obviously as a periodontist, I'm very familiar with the idea that the membrane serving the purpose of excluding soft tissue cells 
But what else it's doing is it's confining our bone graft to the defect. And so we have to compensate for the fact that we're adding this large bulk of, of graft material to support our, our, our goals of regeneration. Our membrane has to do the same thing. It has to extend past the marginals of the defect. So this is a sugar cross link collagen membrane, Osix Plus, that I use quite a bit. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll know that. And I love it because it, it really um, has a very unique handling property. It doesn't have as much lack of memory as a native collagen membrane, but if we hydrate this membrane properly and use it properly, you actually can get it to settle down and confine the defect very, very nicely. And the trick to this, I'll tell you, my trick is extra hydration. So this is one of the few membranes that we actually hydrate extra orally. And so I'll hydrate it for about two minutes. I'll then adapt it over my bone graft, and then I'll use some wet gauze. I'll place it over the margins of the defect in this area, in this area, and I find that I can get it to suck down and really adhere to the native bone very, very nicely. And, and to me, that's a really fundamental advantage that this membrane has. And, and of course, if any of you have used this, you'll know when you uh, uh, open up these cases six months later, you actually see remnants of this membrane still in place. So I really love it for that purpose because I know that it's doing what it's supposed to do. And I'll show you just another quick example of a, of a case on the posterior mandible. Um, you know, not the most challenging case because we have the concavity. I think that's very important in terms of diagnosis of these cases and how we're going to treatment plan these cases is patient's anatomy, how they present. And because this case presented with that beautiful concavity for me to work with, I feel very comfortable using this type of technique, overbuilding it. And knowing when I return to this case, you know, this case maybe five, six months later, I've really reestablished that contour that was lost because the patient had been missing those teeth for a while. And that allows me, of course, to place my implants in that prosthetically driven position and not have to worry that I'm going to have threads exposed. And so this is a, a nice little technique that can be done very, very quickly. Here's a post-op at about two, three years. Um, I, I'm a little bit upset that uh, of the distal cantilever that was placed there. And I maybe could have placed my implants a little bit deeper. I, I encourage everybody to take pictures of your surgeries because that is really how I get better is learning from my own surgeries because you start to see things in the future that um, you don't see at the time of the surgery. We all get very tunnel vision, you know, and, and later on you start to really see what the... Um, the effects of those decisions that you make. There's so many decisions during surgery. So you kind of see that when you take pictures. But nonetheless, this patient is doing very well. It's been about three years and, and they're doing great. There's really no bone loss around our implants. They're, they're clinically stable um, with minimal probing depths. But again, this is just a case where in years past, I would have really been challenged to use much more um, uh, materials that can really predispose you to have post-operative complications. So I've really been falling in love with this technique for these types of cases. And I'll show you just another example here of a case with much more severe bone loss. And I should mention, you know, this is a technique that's really great for horizontal GBR. It's not something that I will typically use for vertical GBR, but this is a good example of how you really, you can obtain some vertical GBR um, with this sort of technique if you are overbuilding and if you are, you know, planning on maybe doing some soft tissue augmentation in combination with this type of technique, it can work really, really well. So here's a case where the patient is a, a chronic periodontal patient and they were doing very, very well coming in on a regular basis for many, many years. But of course, like all of our patients, what, something happened in their, in their personal life that kept them away from the office for many years. Uh, for a couple of years. And when they came back, we were left in this situation where um, we were able to get the majority of their mouth stable with, with good home care and with, you know, um, good, you know, initial disease control and scaling and root planing. But there's just certain teeth that were just, you know, a little bit too far gone. And that's exactly what happened here. So um, I had the decision to make here. Do we try to save the premolar, that first premolar? Do we just, you know, replace all the teeth in this quadrant? And after discussing with the patient, she, she really felt comfortable that, you know, she could trust me that we would be able to replace these premolars. She didn't have an opposing molar. So her, her ideal plan would be to minimize the amount of implants she would need, place two implants, 
maybe restore them with a single premolar and more of a molar shaped tooth. But of course, look what we're dealing with in this posterior site. We have quite a big vertical defect. Um, and that tooth was basically completely outside of the housing of the bone. And now is where this treatment planning comes into play where I have to make a decision as to how much can I regenerate using these resorbable materials? And should I even try to do this at the time of an extraction? Or should I let things heal, let, let all the bacteria sort of die out and, and, and get a lot more uh, healthy, thick, soft tissue? Or can I try to do this all at one time? And again, depending on the patient, this is something where um, I, I wanna try to minimize the number of surgeries for the patient. And if I feel that I can obtain satisfactory results, then maybe it's worth a shot you know, trying at the time of an extraction. And again, here, looking at the, the green line would be really ideal, right? If I could regenerate to here, I would be very, very happy. But being that this isn't in the aesthetic zone, what if I could obtain something like this, which is probably a little bit more realistic? Well, in my mind, I felt like I'd be very, very um, successful to uh, be able to obtain this sort of um, final result because I have those bone peaks to work with. And that's exactly what I decided to do. And so you can see here the intraoral view. You can see the, the deficiency in the soft tissue and the hard tissue in the area of the edentulous molar, which was really precipitated by uh, just a history of chronic gum disease, chronic periodontal disease. The treatment plan was to extract these two teeth. Um, we'll place our incisions in the, in the traditional fashion. I love placing a distal buccal releasing incision. Just gives me plenty of access and ability to coronally reposition my flaps later on. You can see here the extent of the, the, the bone and tissue loss here, especially because these teeth are really in secondary occlusal trauma for quite a while. So you have teeth that have a predisposition to, for periodontal disease, they have a reduced periodontium, and then those normal uh, uh, occlusal forces just are putting so much pressure on those teeth that those teeth are now you know, under fremitus and they're actually being pushed buckly as time goes on. And you can see here where the, the teeth were versus where I really want my implants based on the preoperative wax up and all of our planning. And so you can see we're pretty deficient in that distal, in distal site. Um, in the anterior site, this is a, a lot more predictable of a defect, but I'm treating both of these at the same time. And so I wanna overbuild these areas and you can see here where my ideal regenerative capacity would, would allow me to take this ridge um, versus where we are at the time. And so I'm going to follow a, a very strict protocol here. Of course, extracting of the teeth atraumatically as possible, not to lose any more bone at that time. You can see here, there's almost no socket in that posterior site. That, that socket is completely obliterated by the, the history of gum disease and, and bone loss. But we extract our teeth, and then we spend a really good amount of time degranulating, making sure that there's absolutely no soft tissue remnants. And even though this is a socket and we typically talk about autogenous grafting um, as the gold standard, which I completely agree with, in a case like this where we're trying to grow bone outside the housing and trying to regenerate as much as possible, I will definitely use autogenous scrapings from locally, which is another benefit of that distal releasing incision, just giving me some access to try to put as much life into this bone graft as possible. And that you can see, this is a uh, this non-disposable scraper that comes with a disposable blade, but it allows me to really um, harvest as much autogenous as I need. Um, I try to get as much as 50%, but I gotta be honest, I typically don't. I typically will only get 20, 30% autogenous. I'll mix that with my uh, freeze-dried bone allograft, usually a, a mineralized cortical cancellous mix, either 50-50 or 70-30. I will do my periosteal releasing incision like we talked about earlier, moving from the distal to the mesial, and then I'll stretch within that incision line. And what that does for me is it allows me to now have access to that periosteum so I can use some stabilization sutures, which you'll see here. Um, and so this is how the case ends up after I stabilize. And I can be very critical of my own work and say, I love how this looks on distal, in the mesial, my suture is probably pushing right in the area where I really need bone. And that was partly because I over trimmed my membrane or I didn't use a large enough membrane like we mentioned. So in the perfect world, I'd have one of these anterior sutures resting on native bone. That's really gonna be helpful for any of you that are doing this type of procedure um, to try to keep your sutures resting over native bone. Um, here's a little diagram just showing you exactly what I did. So I'll enter through the palate, I'll go over the membrane, 
I will bite the periosteum. This is very simple to do. And then I will go back over the membrane and back through the palate. So to me, this is, I, I consider this a horizontal mattress. It's almost a, a, a combination or a, 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 you know, a variation of a horizontal and a vertical mattress because we're, we're really moving from mesial to distal. Um, but this is a very simple thing that we can do. And of course, then we can tie it off on the lingual. And again, I like putting those knots on the lingual. I started doing that for patients, especially when they were wearing removable partials or um, you know temporaries that were covering the palate. Um, but then I started using it uh, for cases even when they didn't wear a temporary. Like this patient wasn't wearing a temporary, but I still use this because I just found that I was able to get much more even tension over those sutures. And then of course, we place a secondary one, like you see here, on the distal. I will go ahead and get primary closure. A lot of you will hear me lecture about sockets and how I like to leave things exposed when I can. Well, of course, this is more of a ridge augmentation case. I really need to um, grow as much bone as I can outside the housing. So I'm gonna get primary closure here. And you can see the healing at the bottom of your screen at about two, three weeks. So the patient heals very, very well. They come back for implant placement at about six months. And this is always what we see even though we've regenerated or we think we've regenerated a good amount of new bone, we still have a soft tissue deficiency. And like I said, when I started talking to you about this case, is it's not just about the hard tissue, it's about the soft tissue as well. And so maybe in these cases, because they're not in the aesthetic zone, maybe we can do a combination of hard and soft, to soft tissue augmentation and minimize the amount of procedures the patient needs, but still get a, a good aesthetic and functional result for the long term. But this is a very tough decision because what do we do here? Do we go ahead and do a free gingival grafts in a separate procedure to thicken this tissue first? Or is there a way for me to do some sort of soft tissue augmentation while I place my implants? Of course, it's tricky to do the free gingival graft while I'm placing my implants because I need to create a, a split thickness bed um, to, to put my graft and I really need access to the bone to place my implants. And so I don't really like to complicate things like this. And so this technique of using a modified roll has really been very, very valuable for me, especially in this premolar and molar region. So what I'll do here is I'll um, use this Scharf and, Tano, Scharf and Tarnow technique that was described in 1992. So I, I've been using this technique for um, pretty much as long as I've been a periodontist. And I will make a split thickness trapdoor reflection um, and then remember, this is at the time of the implant placement. And I can do that because once I elevate this split thickness, partial thickness flap on the palate, I can now make incisions to bone, like you can see here outlined in red, and elevate a full thickness flap to expose my bone. And I'm not wasting any tissue. All of this connective tissue that's still bound down to the palatal aspect of the crest will then be folded under that buccal flap. And I really love this technique for the versatility and for the fact that it's only one surgical site. And so that's exactly what I did here. And don't pay attention to the implants right now. We'll show you the bone in a second, but I will just fold that palatal connective tissue under that buccal flap, as you can see here. And again, here's a picture of the bone healed. Okay, so I think overall we did really, really well. I have very few remnants of particular graft. I have nice, healthy bleeding bone. I'm getting very good torque upon placement of those implants. And then you can see here the before, the during, and the after. And so did I regenerate this defect 100%? Absolutely not. But did I substantially increase the amount of bone width I have in, in both of those implant sites? I think you, you'd be hard pressed to say that I didn't. And again, because the treatment plan here was just for two implants, that's exactly what I did. You can see how once I have the implants in place, they had very good stability. I'm gonna go ahead and use healing abutments to help uh, support my soft tissue graft that I'm doing at the same time. And I'm getting closure just like this. And I'm not worried about leaving things a little bit exposed. I know this is gonna granulate in. But you can just imagine now how much bulk I have on the buckle where I was really super deficient prior to this step in the, in the process. And this is the healing after about two to three months.
you can see we, we have the ability now to use temporaries or to, uh, to use um, custom healing abutments to really uh, bulk out that tissue even more or to start creating the emergence profile. Um, in this case, I then refer the, the patient back to their general dentist and they did a beautiful job um, with their final crown. So you'll see that here. Here's the impressions and, and their screw retained crowns that were fabricated. And we have a result to me that is really more than I could have expected from based on where we started with only resorbable materials, not even a non-resorbable suture until that you know, soft tissue grafting procedure. And taking a look at the pre and the post-op, I think it really highlights you know, just how much vertical we were actually able to maintain, obtain, again, not just from hard tissue grafting, but also some soft tissue component to the grafting as well. And so um, I think that using tacks and screws is incredible. And the more we get good at it, the better we are. And, and the more practice, you know, we use uh, tacks and screws, we're going to get better. But for the majority of my cases, I've been able to get really good results by using stabilization sutures. But again, the hardest part about using the tacks and the screws in, isn't just putting a screw or a tack into the bone. Now, of course, that's easy. The hard part is when we're trying to stabilize a membrane and the membrane wants to tear or the membrane wants to twist like I showed you earlier. So this was an idea I had a couple months ago and I was really just waiting for a good case to use it. I kind of forgot about it and then I worked this case and I flapped it open and it was very, very thin. And of course, in this area of the mouth, we have to worry about the mental foramen and, and all those branches of the nerve. And I decided, you know, I have have this tack kit and the screw kits that I, I know are difficult to use with membranes, but what if I use them just to hold my stabilization suture so I don't have to bite the periosteum? And I, what I did was I used that Profix kit I showed you earlier, and I actually used the implant attachment like you saw in an earlier picture, and I placed these three, um, three millimeter membrane fixation screws not to depth, to about one millimeter from being at the level of the bone. And the reason why I did this was because I know I want to get stabilization, but again, I mentioned to you where the nerve is and thinking, trying to really grow bone outside the housing as much as I could in a case like this without using a reinforced membrane. You can see here what I did. So now I have my very large collagen membrane. I am really overbuilding this area. And then I'm using those screws as opposed to using the periosteum to hold things tight. Now, this technique is something that we've been working on, Dr. Putterman and myself now over the last couple of weeks, we've each done a bunch of cases and it's not something that I think, you know, we all wanna do um, in every single case because it's not like, you know, I can tell you, oh, here's a picture, now go do this. It does take practice. But I will tell you, I was really able to overbuild this case quite a bit. And I think probably more so than I normally am able to do by biting the periosteum. Why? Well, even though that periosteum is released from the flap, once you go to get primary closure of your, your overlying flaps, things still do want to move. Things do want to move coronally. And you do oftentimes lose tension in some of those stabilization sutures. And when you do it this way, it's almost like you're doing the sausage technique because that flap and that stabilization of that membrane complex are completely independent of each other. And so I was really happy with myself when I thought of this because it really did work well. Again, I can go ahead now and get primary closure very, very easily, not have to worry about coronally positioning or losing tension in those underlying sutures that are so important to stabilize the membrane, okay? And I knew I was onto something because right away, um, you know, some amazing clinicians started DMing me and, and making diagrams for me. This was an incredible diagram by uh, Dr. Ryan No, who's a periodontal resident. You can follow him at Hard Palate. He's, he's worked with some amazing clinicians, making diagrams for them for their lectures and things like that. And so, um, you know, this is something that I'm going to be working on more and more. And I'd love to see anybody who's, who's tried this sort of technique or, um, you know, has any questions about it, you know, please let me know. I I'm really, you know, heavily invested in trying to make things simpler for all of us, trying to increase predictability for all of these cases. Um, and, and I think the most important thing is continuing to learn together because that's really what, you know, platforms like Instagram and your platform, um, you know, has really 
made easier for us. They, this wasn't possible years ago. And so I just love you know, this communal feel. Um, and so on the left, you see, you know, the typical scenario that I will do using these uh, horizontal periosteal stabilization sutures. And then this newer technique of using tacks, I like to call this the tack roast or the screw roast technique. Um, but hopefully, you know, follow me on Instagram, you'll see more of these cases coming out because we've been using it more and more. Uh, and like I said, it's not the not going to be simple. Nothing in life is simple. Nothing that's worth anything in life is simple, but it does give you a, a lot of advantages over using the periosteum. And I find that I'm able to get really nice stabilization. And a lot of the keys are the same, you know, keeping that membrane extended past the margin of the defect, making sure you're, you're using an adequate amount of bone graft. Um, and then we're just following the past principles. Um, so that's my presentation. Um, and Let's talk about it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. I have to say, I truly, truly, truly enjoyed it. And I really have to say, as I, as we before started the presentation, I was really looking forward to hear this unique approach that you presented beautifully. And you know, I have to say, I have so many things to discuss with you because uh, you're a great fan of GBR and horizontal format and me too so i think there are lots of things to discuss and want to clear some points for our audience also one of the first things that i really want to ask you is the how do you see the importance of choosing the th proper thickness of the membrane in doing the horizontal ridge augmentation because usually in different companies we have like 0.2 to 0.6 or 0.6 to 1 or one and a half millimeter of thickness of the membrane. So in your experience, did you find any of those being easier to adopt and to form and to handle during your procedure? Um, that's a great question. So, you know, for me, the mainstay, the main membranes that I use, it's for the most part, two categories, right? It's either that A6 plus sugar cross link membrane, which I know is about 0.2 millimeters thick. And, and to me, that, that thickness is really ideal for a lot of these cases. Um, but I think you can't, be, you can't think about it in terms of just the thickness. I think it, it depends on the chemistry of the membrane. So that membrane, even though it's very, very thin, it's 0.2 millimeters thick, we know it has the greatest resistance to degradation, which is why I love it. It gives me that security. That's not to say, and I, I really struggled pick, picking cases for this because I have so many amazing cases where I stabilize with sutures, BioGuide, right? Now, BioGuide, I think, is a little bit thicker, possibly. Um, and of course, BioGuide also comes in a BioGuide compressed. Um, and for me, I don't really decide which I'm using based on the thickness. For me, it's which size the membrane comes in. Mm -hmm. Because we're limited by that, right? BioGuide comes in a 25 by 25, or then you have to jump up to a 40 by 50. Well, I am definitely not pinching, pinching pennies. And I don't like to look at, you know, the cost of the membrane for the case. I, I, you have to use what's, what's the case demands. But you also don't want to throw money in the garbage and you want to be sort of... Um, doing what's best for the patient, but also not, you know, overcharging them for things. And so I actually switched a lot of my cases to use the BioGuide compressed because, because it comes in that 20 by 30, right? Because if you're using a 25 by 25, you can stretch that and you can use that for like a three tooth defect. But if you're using stabilization sutures, you can't stretch it enough to really cover that area. And so that's when I'll use the 20 by 30. Now, I definitely have mixed results with, um, you know, the native collagen membrane. And I find that if it opens, that's when I'm seeing that my bone regeneration underneath is not quite as good as when I'm using the sugar cross-link membrane. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts about the thickness of the membrane because we're so limited by what the material, the manufacturer comes out with. Yeah, because, you know, exactly the points are right that you mentioned, because not the, the, the thickness is not the only factor that we should think about. But in some clinicians' point of view, some people think that cross-link membranes works better. Some people prefer, prefer native collagen without being cross-link. So in those cases, the thicker the membrane, usually the handling going to be easier. 
I'm, yes. not, I'm not going to say about uh, how it happens during the process of remodeling in GBR healing, but the handling during putting the membrane in the site is also important. So the reason that I asked about thickness was that usually in my experience, I found thicker the membrane. I'm not going to say thicker, like more than one millimeter, but as you said, the quality of the membrane is also important, but thicker the membrane, I found it easier during the procedure to handle because sometimes the thin membranes, uh, when they become wet with blood, yeah. it's not that easy to handle. So if you're fast enough to tag or screw and fix, mm -hmm. it's fine. But if it takes more time, you will lose yeah. the shape of the membrane and it becomes messy, you know? So that was one of the reasons that I wanted to know your thoughts on that. And you talked about the comparison between tags, screws, and also you showed the sutures in stabilization of the membrane. Mm -hmm. One of the concerns that sometimes we may have when we want to fix the membranes with sutures is about the borders of the membrane. Because with tags or yeah. screws, we can go all around and make sure it's completely contained and completely mm -hmm. you know, packed with graft underneath. But when yeah. we are doing sutures, usually the borders are, you know, are not on the bone completely. So I wanted mm -hmm. to, did you find this as a problem in comparison with fixation with the tags or there is no issue about it? It is definitely a problem and not so much because I'm worried that there's a little bit of particulate creeping out. I'm worried about it because I need that volume of bone graft to stay where I need it. And I will say for those cases where, you know, there's a solution to every problem. Um, at least, you know, we can look for solutions and, and there's ones that I found to help me. So for instance, if I over trim my membrane or I don't compensate for as much bone graft, uh, for as much volume of bone graft, so then I over trim my membrane, or maybe I just selected a membrane that was too short. I'll go ahead and now use like a, a amnion chorion membrane or a PRF membrane. And I'll use that to, to help me when I'm getting closure, if I'm seeing that my sutures are sort of slipping off the sides. But I think really the key there is, is keeping your, your bites, your stabilization bites really lateral and making sure again, that that membrane is not trimmed too much. Because I find that having that, like if you saw in that diagram that I had Dr. No create for us, you know, you have to have that membrane extend you know, laterally well past the margins of the defect. Because otherwise when you're stabilization with sutures, yeah, that looks really simple to do. And we all know, nothing is easy. Like I said, nothing worth doing is easy. Um, but there is certainly uh, a simplicity to it compared to using tacks and screws, but there's certainly very small details that you have to be aware of. And one of them is as you're trying to get su stabilization, those sutures can slip off to the side. Um, you know, I think that in every technique, there's going to be those little details to pay attention to. Um, I find I would rather have to worry about that because I know how to fix it from the beginning, as opposed to being stuck in a case where, um, you know, the patient can't open, so I just can't fixate on the palate. There's just impossible. For me, I'm one of those guys, when I do get out the tacks and the screws, like I mentioned, I always have both kits there, because I don't know, you know, during the procedure, the patient's going to get tired. The cortical bone could be so dense that you just cannot use even that amazing kit that Dr. Istvan Urban created. It's just not so easy for us, us mere mortals. And so there are challenges with each technique. I always like to say that when you're using a sausage technique, or even you're, if you're doing ridge augmentation with titanium reinforced PTFE, once you get it stable, that's it. You're done. So you, your closure ends up being very passive, meaning that, you know, you don't really have to think about the graft membrane complex anymore. You're done with that. Whereas when you are using stabilization sutures, as you start to get closure, things move a little bit. And so you have to be paying attention to how much tension you're putting, or even just when you're taking pictures because you want to record your work like I do a lot, you could actually release tension in those stabilization sutures just by having the assistant pulling the cheek or reflection too bad. Whereas that won't happen with, you know, tacks and screws. So I think tacks and screws are a mainstay. They always will be. I'm very interested in a lot of these companies now coming out with resorbable tacks and screws. 
because that's a very cool concept that allows you to sort of get the best of both worlds, not having to worry about, you know, removing these tacks and screws, but it's still always going to be a challenge. And of course, there's risk in, in having to deal with tacks and screws in terms of damage to adjacent teeth and things like this. Um, but yeah, I, I like to consider, you know, this type of thing as an active closure. You, you can't, you know, stop paying attention when you're getting closure because you can loosen or release, re reduce tension in your stabilization sutures while you're getting closure if you're not paying close attention to that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, you know, I want to know, what, this is one of my questions. Actually, I tried it in many cases. And honestly, I think in more than 60, 70% of the cases in this specific scenario that I'm going to tell, tell you about it, it works. But I want to know your experience because it's not mm -hmm. generally maybe accepting by so many people. In concave defects, uh, which are contained, but in single tooth uh, areas, edentulous areas, Sometimes it's possible. I think you showed one of your cases. It was the same one to mm -hmm. one implant placement, the concave defect. You place your implants and you did the GBR. You fix with the sutures, as I remember, or tags. What if we don't reflect the flap that much and pack the graft in the concavity without using membranes? Because the periosteum is intact. We can just achieve a closure by one single periosteal release. And mm -hmm. your follow-ups, you see that it works. Uh, I mean, in single tooth, maybe we have adjacent teeth. I want to know yeah. how was your experience in such cases that in small areas, is it really necessary to release the flap, to reflect the flap, always put the tags and always put the sutures and use the membranes? Or in small defects, it's possible just to like do a tunnel, but from the crest, yeah. not from the lateral. So first I wanna address one thing you said is a very good point. If you don't reflect your flap so much, if you're not opening things so much, well then sure, your flap helps to contain your defect to some extent, right? It's when you, then once you start opening things, well then you have to put it back together. Now, I, I definitely believe in this concept that the periosteum can act like a membrane into some res in some respects, right? It's keeping soft tissue from growing into it. I just don't find that it helps to confine the defect and I battle with having too much tension on closure, right? So if I was to do that same case you mentioned, maybe just make a small crestal incision. I notice that the buckle plate's very thin. I can put my implant in, but rather than placing a vertical and really getting exposure of the depth of that defect, I just pack my bone graft. Will that turn into bone? Yes, I think some of it will. I think the bone maybe closest to the buccal plate will, but it's very rare in those cases for us to then open it up and really see it. And I remember years ago on Instagram challenging someone to say, show me one of those cases. Mm -hmm. And I'm not criticizing oral surgeons because uh, they're the most talented, gifted people I know. And they, they, some of the work that they do is so mind blowing to me. But a lot of them are not trained in using membranes like periodontists are. And a lot of them are the ones that will tell me, oh, well, you don't even need a membrane. You don't need a collagen membrane, right? I always challenge them, show me one of those cases. Mm -hmm. um, it also reminds me of the SMART technique, which is now becoming you know, very popular and we see that a lot. And I believe that that's a great way to go because it allows you not to have to elevate the marginal soft tissue. And so for aesthetic reasons, that's really great. But by the nature of that technique, we're not opening it to see what we're obtaining. Yeah, yeah. So whether we know our implant went in with very good primary stability and you put a healing abutment on it and you put, you know, you get some sort of closure even without a periosteal release, but we're never opening it again. And so I really am doubtful and it's hard to say how much bone we're growing or, or what, is, what does it look like histologically. I think maybe we're growing a meatloaf that's what one of my professors used to say, we're growing a meatloaf, but is it a meatloaf of bone or is it just repair? Yeah. That's, that's a question for, you know, somebody who has access to, to do some really good clinical research um, to, to really see what the difference in regeneration is. Um, I'm starting to send for some histology. I, I've, we started a research group that I'm very excited about. And that's one of the things that we do want to look at is the, the real regeneration potential 
under some of these membranes because you know it's different between the different membranes. And then of course, if you're not using a collagen membrane and you're using amnion chorion, or you're using PRF, or you're just using the periosteum, what's the difference? We don't know. Yeah. I don't think anybody's really elucidated that yet. Yeah. You're Does right. it matter clinically? I don't know either. I just know in my, I'm, I want to know that whatever I put there is going to have the greatest chance to regenerate into bone. Yeah, exactly. And you know, regarding, regarding the, the, your technique that you showed that you used uh, screws for handling the sutures and fixing the membrane, I think one of the benefits that we can say those te this technique can have is that when we tag or screw the membrane, about one, two, or three millimeters around those tags, the membrane is completely attached to the bone, so there is less space for packing yep. it after. But when you put your screws out of the border of the membrane, so you have the area for packing more bones, so that may be put it in a more predictable way. Do you think it's right to think that way? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've seen that firsthand for myself in, in the cases where I was using the sausage technique because you, you can certainly compress your graft where you don't want it. Now, that could be, uh, there's a lot of ways to fix that problem, right? But sometimes we are limited where the mental, where the inferior alveolar nerve is, where we're limited by anatomical things. So I think that that's certainly one of the things that I was thinking about was I want to grow with bone outside the housing and I don't want to be um, putting too much pressure in the most critical area where I actually need to regenerate bone. Exactly. And, and Matthew, you showed in the model because I think that's one of the problems that so many clinicians may have faced that when they want to put the screws in the membrane, the membrane rotates. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you showed that, but I want to know in those cases that you want to use handpiece to fix the screws, fix the membrane with the screws. How do you how do you prevent that rotation of the membrane? Do you do the make a perforations in the membrane prior to do the fixation, or you keep the membrane and then do it? What's your what's your uh, so I don't like putting a, a perforation in the membrane. Uh, you certainly can do that, but it's very difficult to predict exactly where that perforation needs to be. And, you know, now that I'm doing this hands-on course every couple of months with Dr. Putterman, you know, two things have come of it. Number one, I'm sort of getting a feel for how far I can stretch that native collagen membrane, depending on the defect. So you definitely can learn from that. But it's really what Dr. Putterman taught me with videos, uh, amazing videos. I know you're, you're probably be interviewing him soon, so you can ask him too. But his trick is that, you know, he doesn't like tacking. He just doesn't like it, he, you know, just for the same reason we're all getting away from using osteotomes. I mean, my mentor in, in training, Dr. Tai Kang, was a, a, an amazing surgeon. And every case I ever showed him that required a sinus lift, he had me using osteotomes. Mm -hmm. So in my residency, I probably did 300 osteotome cases. I get out of school, you start going into the real world and you're tapping on people and they look at you like, this can't be legal. There's no way this is like, what are you doing? You know? And so um, we all hate the tacking. So I said to Israel, well, why are you not using the master pin? Istvan Urban was your teacher. Obviously, you know about it. Why aren't you using it? And he just said he does not like the trauma and he showed me his videos. So what he's doing, and I don't like to seal his thunder, but it's okay. He's gripping the membrane very, very firmly with a cotton plier or a tissue pickup and holding it in place. This requires you to have a very good assistant that's reflecting for you. So you can use your two hands, one hand gripping the membrane really, really tautly, and then using that um, implant driver to put that apical pressure into the bone. And it really does work. Does it work on the first try every time? No. And you know that because, you know, the bone, on, especially in the lingual of the mandible is very, very tough. But I would much more prefer to make a perforation into the bone than I am to put a perforation into the membrane. I just, like I said, it's hard to predict exactly how far that membrane is going to stretch. And so I, I find when I've done that, I'm just never in the right spot. Yeah, yeah. And Matthew, you, uh, I want to ask another question regarding the, fixing the uh, membranes with the technique that you showed with the screws, with the sutures. What is, the, is it, is it a, is, should be a specific pattern for the suturing? Because in the, in the um, schematic view that you showed in your last mm -hmm. slide, 
the sutures was like cross, you know, from, from the screw in the mesial side to the mm -hmm. uh, lingual part of the flap, for example, to the distal side. Should it be like a cross or is it okay even do it side by side? Yeah, I, I mean, actually, in my per, in my case, I did a combination. I had, I think, I had one that was first. So I always will try to secure with sutures, just like with the sausage technique. How you're going to put your screws in the more difficult place first. I will usually put that do the first stabilization sutures in the more difficult area or the area furthest from my releasing incision. Mm -hmm. So because that's where you have the less le least amount of visualization. And so even in that case, I think I did like a single first. And then when I went and moved laterally to do another one, I kind of made it a little bit more continuous. Why? Well, I'm just learning from, you know, someone like um, Dr. Nieva, right? So he does the lasso technique and he does continuous with his stabilization sutures. Why? Because he can get then even tension over the, you know, the entirety of his, of his uh, graft. The problem I was having if I was always you know, fixated on doing that was there's some cases that are very difficult. The patient's tongue's in the way. There's a lot of saliva. You, you keep going, you keep, you know, making it continuous, you get to the end and then something gets loose, which is very frustrating. Yeah. And so I prefer to break them up if I can. No, but, I mean, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I mean, the fixing the membrane with the screws, you mean, I mean, your, yeah. your technique because yeah. not the flap, but the membrane. Mm -hmm. No, sure. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. I feel like, you know, if you, if you make it continuous and everything's going great, but then you get to the end yeah. and then all of a sudden, you know, the suture snaps or the suture breaks, then you have to start over. So I like the idea of getting one nice stabilization suture in because after getting that first stabilization suture in, everything else is less mobile. It stays in place easier. And so on that second stabilization suture that I initiate, if I want to wrap it around the screw, go back through the pallet and then come back over and, and wrap another screw, I can do that. But at least I've had that initial stabilization suture sort of holding things in place. And just so you know, me and Israel have been playing with a lot of ideas. He actually did one last week where he, he tied his um, suture around the little tack before he even put the tack into the bone because then it's already initiated. So there's all these little tricks and you can be certainly artistic about it, but it depends on the shape of the defect and, and to me the access that the patient's you know, giving you and your patience, right? We all have to have more patience in, in general, but you, this isn't the type of thing that you do quickly. You go slow and steady. That will definitely give you better results than you know, trying to go really quickly, over tightening the sutures and then compressing the bone graft in the wrong spot. Exactly. Well, Matthew, I have to say, um, your topic is very interesting and, you know, we can talk about it for lots, but, you know, I know the time is limited. So I just want to have one more last question because it's a controversy uh, in many clinicians' ideas and that's the decortication. Me personally, I'm a great fan of decortication, especially in the mandible because I think that we need blood. And, mm -hmm. you know, in mandible, when we have dense bone, you know, it's not really imaginable for me not doing that and waiting mm -hmm. for information. But because it's a controversy, I want to know what is your idea on that? And do you recommend it or do you find any difference or not? I think it's a ridiculous controversy. I couldn't agree with you more for, for two reasons. Number one, I know that there's literature that says, after two years, maybe there's no difference in bone quality. But when I put my bone graft, whether or not I'm using autogenous or not, mostly I am, you know, try to get at least 20, 30% autogenous. Even in that case, your bone graft just looks like such an inanimate object. You know, there's, there's, you need, we know that we need blood supply. So to me, it's crazy not to for the second reason, because it's so easy to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's very few parts of the procedure that are easy, but this is really the most easy thing that we can do. So in certain cases, you know, in the maxilla, actually that case, I think I showed you, I don't think I did 
um, create intramural penetrations, but you also noticed how much bleeding I had. And one of the areas was actually a socket. And so maybe in those cases, it's not so important. Plus, even though I didn't show you an x-ray there, that in the distal, there was a sinus. So I didn't want to perforate into the maxillary sinus. But for the for 99% of the cases, you know, it's very simple and very safe to create those intramural penetrations. So it seems, I know this is not a very scientific answer, but why not do it? There's no, there's no harm to not doing it. Yeah. And I will tell you of the cases that I have uncovered where I've been dissatisfied in my career, I always have to go back to the drawing board and think to myself, what did I do wrong? Did I use a different bone graft? Was the bone not, did I not use enough autogenous, right? So you want to minimize all the possible things that can lead to a result that's not ideal. And so that's a great thing that I can just check off the list and say, you know what, I know I, I did the best I could because I created enough blood supply. And if it doesn't work out or if I don't regenerate as much as I want to, at least I know that I eliminated that variable. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Completely. So I agree. I think, I think why not do it? It's so simple to do. Um, and I think the more blood supply you put into the defect, the better off you're going to be. Exactly. Exactly. Totally agree with you. Well, Matthew, I have to say, I totally appreciate your time. And no, thank you. With us, my pleasure to have you. And thank you again for accepting. I truly enjoyed it. I'm pretty sure everybody did. And really hope to see you very soon, my friend. Hats off. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to more of your, your season three. Thank you so, so you much. You have some great guests. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Stay safe, my friend. God bless you.